Good afternoon, Emory families. Welcome to our Family Friday webinar. And today we have a very important topic on what to expect during move-in. We have a group of experts that will be talking with you about the health, safety, um, living arrangements for your students, and we're excited to talk with you. I'm Bridget Guernsey Reardon, and I'm from Campus Life Family Programs, and I'm joined by my co-facilitator, Sherry Oprins from the college. So Sherry, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hi families. Thanks for joining us again um, in our Family Friday webinar series. I'm Sherry Obrens. I work in the Office for Undergraduate Education. Um, we're really excited to jump into our um, presentation and talk with our panelists who will answer many of the questions that you're posing in the chat. Um, we do wanna remind everybody that there's a lot of great information on our website um, and those are being updated in real time. So uh, those are posted on the screen great websites to bookmark for now um, in case you've missed a message or um, want the most up-to-date information, they're all posted there. So without further ado, we are going to jump in and briefly introduce our panelists. Um, they will also introduce themselves as they get to their sections. Um, so we might say, as, as Bridget and I are monitoring the chat, we know that this is going to come up soon. We'll wait for that person to go. And if you all don't mind, Sherry and I usually try to pitch in during this. If there's a question we think that the panelists might benefit from hearing, or if you have something we're seeing in the chat. So we just kind of do a lot of give and take amongst the panelists. We also want to let you know this is informal. We want to have fun with you today. It's a very stressful time for everyone. However, we want move in to be something that you're comfortable with and that you feel prepared for. So a lot of information. And as we've noted before, this will be recorded. You'll be able to access it at a later date. But we look forward to talking with you today and giving you some really helpful information. Great. So let's get started. All right, I think we're going to start by talking about our seven steps before moving in. So all of the things you should be thinking about in the next two weeks um, to make sure that you are students and you are ready to join us on campus. And I will turn it over um, to our student um, panelists to get us started. Hello everyone and, and welcome. I'm glad you're joining us today. I know there's lots of information to cover. Um, so we're excited to share what's been put in place. And I'm all about checklists and knowing exactly what I need to do when. Um, so seven steps so we can count down what exactly this, uh, our students need to do before they come. Um, I'm Sharon Rabinovitz. I'm the Executive Director of Student Health. I've been at Emory for about three years. Um, so we welcome you. It's a wonderful place to be, to work and for the students. So arriving, there's seven steps that they have to go through, they can access it through um, Opus, and there's gonna be an onboarding um, website opening on Monday, if I'm correct, um, that they will be able to hit all these highlighted elements. Um, the first element is really painting a picture and also um, really delineating the expectations for students to arrive on campus, what the environment looks like, what the rules of engagement are, and there's a place where students have to review and acknowledge um, all of this to know, so we know that they are aware of what's ex expected um, and the process by which we um, address people who don't follow um, these guidelines. So that's step number one. We also have to kind of piggyback on that training. It's a module on ELMS, which is a leader, which is a learning module that they get to learn a little more even um, so coming kind of coming to life of what this looks like. Um, and it has quizzes and interactive elements, videos, a welcome from our Dean, Dean Galai. Um, and so that's a training module that is also required. Um, very informative, talks about a lot of the mitigating strategies, personal protective equipment, hygiene, self-monitoring for symptoms, um, other important health and safety guidelines. Um, and if other training is needed over time, we will add to that. Speaking of self-monitoring, there is a health assessment that everyone has to do. It's a health screening, and it really is a guideline of what people are supposed to be asking themselves every day, what symptoms they have, what they're feeling, if they've been exposed, what their temperature is. And so that is also um, needed 
um, prior to arriving. That's also going to be asked prior to being tested. So it's again, it's an iterative, iterative process of getting all of us, we all have to do this, get into um, the habit of really assessing, am I feeling different? What else, what else um, is happening with my body that I have to be aware of and, and reach out for help when, when needed. Um, and this is one of the things, um, Mary Beth Sexton is one of our experts here and she is in the clusters that we've seen, it really is when people have very minor symptoms and they kind of blow it off because that's what we do, we keep on going. And that's when you really have to kind of get a good understanding of what your body is like and if there's a difference to reach out for help. Um, the other thing people have to do is go into PeopleSoft and put in their emergency contacts and update that and you're signing up for emergency um, notification system which will notify you if you are considered a close contact. Um, we do have contact tracing that is, um, we have started a, a whole contact tracing team at Emory um, to help and augment um, the abilities of the Department of Health um, so we can contact people faster and more efficiently. So that's what the notification system is about, contact tracing. Um, when you're a close contact defined by the CDC, um, within six feet for greater than 15 minutes, we have a team that reaches out to the um, positive student and really assesses who is a close contact. And if a person is gets a text message saying you're a close contact, then it gives you directives to reach out to student health. If you don't get that message, you are not considered a close contact based on the interview um, from the index or the positive student. And what we're gonna talk about a lot today is the COVID testing. So there is scheduling that will be up um, that you have been, have you already have had access to that. So I know there's a lot of people already signed up. Um, so we, we will talk about COVID testing a lot and what it really looks like when you arrive on campus. Um, and then the last thing near and dear to me, actually all of it's near and dear to me, but especially immunizations, we wanna make sure that everybody's um, immunization compliant before they arrive. Um, the last thing we need um, in the middle of a pandemic is an epidemic or an outbreak of measles or mumps or some other preventable vac vaccine preventable illness. So there's about 240 um, under, uh, undergrad students who are non-compliant. So if you're one of those, it's really important that you fill out um, the forms on our portal and upload your immunization records so you do not get detoured before you go to the residence halls. This is very, very important. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to our co-clinical director, um, Betsy Rothschild, to take it from here. Hey y'all, welcome from Emory Student Health. I am a physician assistant here. I've been a PA for over 20 years. I started in college health and 2005 and then came back to Emory in 2009. Um, when I'm not at Student Health, I teach over in the School of Medicine for the PA students. So I wanted to talk a little bit about testing um, that Dr. R mentioned. So on the day before you come, make sure there are a couple of really important things. Um, you will have signed up for testing on the website, so you'll have a date and you'll need to print out two forms from that to bring with you. So you'll actually need to bring those um, paper forms. Part of your packing is you need to make sure to have a go bag. So 10 days worth of items um, that you need to pack up that if you um, were to be were testing positive, that would be your bag that you could live out of for 10 days. Um, a very important thing the morning that you're being tested or that you're traveling, make sure your phone is charged. A lot of the communication on this day of move-in is going to be by text message or by phone. So you want to make sure your phone is charged. Um, and a really important thing, I think this came up in the chat, is if you are sick, um, you want to stay at home and get care there. We don't want you to come to campus if you're sick. Um, if you um, have been in close contact with someone in the last 14 days that has a positive COVID test, that's another reason that you don't want to come to campus. So the testing that we're talking about today is for people asymptomatic, meaning you don't have symptoms, you've not been exposed. So those are two reasons that you would want to delay your arrival. Um, and the team has made great arrangements for that delayed arrival if the need arises. Um, a couple of other things. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions here at Student Health. So people that have had maybe recent COVID testing um, that is great. We still want you to be tested on the day of move-in. So 
there is a small chance you could have been exposed since your last test or um, you were incubating, for example. So you might've been exposed, but the symptoms hadn't shown up yet. The difference would be is if you had a positive test. So if you've already had COVID over the last six months, we would want you to upload a copy of your positive test to our student health portal and let us know about that. So if you've had COVID um, in the spring or early summer, then you would just need to let us know about that. Um, so a couple of things, anything I left out team, if you join it, jump in if I've left out something. So on the day of the testing, you're going to, um, there are two different ways to test. There's the drive-in route and the walk-in route. So we'll cover both, but basically you'll be welcomed by an Emory person and everyone will be given a welcome kit. And we have a great um, slide of the welcome kit and its content. So the cloth face mask, there's a thermometer, there's hand sanitizer, there's um, a clip you can hold your face mask on. Um, there's a tool where you can open doors safely without touching them. So it's a great welcome kit, um, but you'll get in line if you're in the drive-through and first you'll be greeted by the testing organization, Peachtree Immediate Care. You'll go through a health screen with them. They'll take those papers that you printed out um, that your parents reminded you to bring, and then you'll get in line for testing. So a little bit about testing, I think being in the medical clinic, um, we're really used to that, but a lot of people get nervous with the testing. So there are two types of nose swabs that you can get for testing for COVID. This particular nose swab is not the deep one that goes all the way back to your throat, but the one that goes only about an inch to an inch and a half in your nose. So if you think about that, um, an inch is about down to your first knuckle on your second finger. So it's a pretty short swab. Um, and the test is also a quicker test. So it's usually um, the test is finished in maybe 20 to 40 minutes. Um, but once you get tested, if you're in your car, you're going to drive to a designated place to park and you'll wait in your car. Um, a couple of things, of just basics about the testing. Only the student will be tested. No one else in the car can be tested. The student will want to bring a government issued ID, such as a passport or a license. Um, the, when you're waiting in the car, if there's a... Um, a need to get out of the car to use the facilities. There'll be some out, outdoor portable facilities at all the sites. Um, there'll be hand sanitizing stations. So there's plenty of um, things as you're waiting on your test. A little bit different, so that's more of how the drive-through testing works. So you don't have to get out of your car. The only caveat I've noticed is if you're in the back seat and your car windows don't roll all the way down, it's harder to access. So make sure the window that you as the student are sitting next to rolls all the way down so there's good access. Um, if you're on the walk-in site, there will be a designated place for drop-off. So you, you and any family members with you can be dropped off right at the Emory Conference Center Hotel. You'll go into the ballroom that's to the right of the entrance. Only the student can go into the testing line. So any family members will stay outside um, in a de designated area. There's also an area that will, you can securely keep your luggage during the testing time. All the procedures inside the building, there's spacing and safety according to the CDC guidelines. Um, you'll be greeted by one of the testing center employees. You'll be given papers to sign. You'll get a souvenir pen um, and you'll stand in line to be tested and you just walk up to the testing space when you're called then you exit the building and wait in a designated area outside or in an air conditioned area that's, um, that's also designated. So at those sites, um, whether you're in the car, walk up, um, if your result is negative, you'll get an immediate, you'll get a text message when your test is done. Um, that, um, and I think Dr. R, you're gonna talk a little bit about the next steps um, for that, but that's where your cell phone really needs to be um, charged and ready. Um, if you have a positive test, um, if you're in your car, one of the staff members will actually come up to your car and inform you. If you're at the walk-up area, one of the staff members will come up to you and inform you. Um, and then the next steps based on your test results, I'll toss it back to um, Dr. R so she can explain. Absolutely. And I'm trying to also 
um, keep up with chat. A couple things that came up is there are four testing sites, um, one of which is the Emory Conference Center. So that's the only walk-up site, um, walk site, but there's four total sites, six pods, what they, what they call pods. So on the Briarcliff location, if you're designated to the Briarcliff location, there's actually two different sites. So you have to make sure you go into the right queue. Um, and the same thing with the alumni, um, how, with the Miller Ward Alumni House also. There's two different lines that you're gonna have to go into um, and just follow. There's gonna be lots of great signage um, for everyone to go into the right, right area. And the other thing is the test will take about, about 30 minutes, um, but please, you know, in case there's any um, rain delays, emergencies, um, bu you know, bumper, you know, any accidents. So be careful. We don't want any, um, you know, bump, uh, fender benders um, in the queue. So, but hopefully that won't slow us down or anything will um, happen to slow us down. So plan at least an hour to get in and, and get out, um, but um, making sure that, that things don't always run smoothly. We, we will do everything to make it run smoothly. So count on about an hour. And I was trying to think if there's anything else um, in the chat, but please feel free to um, let me know if there's other things we need to talk about. But what we're going to do now is, you know, we're all worried about that positive test. And luckily, the prevalence is not that high. We're talking, um, we're talking about about 50, 60 tests, hopefully are positive and not more. We know that we're bringing a lot of people from a lot of places. And we're so we're inheriting a lot of um, prevalence points from a lot of different places. Um, so I know that's a, a very anxiety provoking, but the numbers are still very, very low. Um, and so most of you will go through this without a problem whatsoever. And it'll just be a reassuring. Again, the test is only one point in time. So we're knowing for that one point in time that everyone's okay. Um, but we all want you to know the, the process for if you are positive, what happens? And this is also similar to what happens if a student becomes positive once they're here. These, these processes will look different because the entry point will look different, but the resources and the support are the same. Um, so at the drive-in site, um, like Betsy said, you will have gone and parked. Um, instead of getting a text message though, you will get that, that private touch point that the test is positive. You will get a discharge summary, a discharge recommendation, and you'll be directed to the Emory um, Conference Center Hotel. Um, and there'll be directions to go there. Um, you'll be um, directed to the parking deck and we have secured a location that is offset and actually very pretty. Um, so the surroundings will hopefully be a little bit more calming, um, but directing you to what they call the Silver Bell Pavilion. And we've um, sectioned it off to make sure that there's some private consultation areas um, to speak with our isolation coordinator, our medical staff, um, and anyone else, anyone else that's needed, Bridget um, is on speed dial or will be on, on site to make sure that everyone has um, support, especially the parents going through this. Um, so we will go through the options of whether people wanna stay, wanna go home. Um, we really kind of talk through that, talk about what the resources are, which I'm gonna to touch briefly here about. Um, and then um, you're, if you decide to stay, your luggage will be We'll ask you to take your luggage out of the car, wrap anything that um, cannot be sanitized, because what we do, we sanitize all the belongings, um, which is a light mist. And then we then we take it to, um, not we being my, the big, the big strong people that do this work for us, um, we'll take it all to the dorm. So it'll be there and waiting and secured for the student when they are out of isolation. Um, <clears throat> so if they go to the, um, the the uh, hotel, they'll be, well, it's like check-in. They'll be given their card access. We'll type in their name, where they're staying. Um, and then one parent will be able to go to the room. We know that will be a difficult time. We wanna make sure that you have that touch, that private touch point. Um, and then we will make sure that the student and the parents know exactly what's, what life in isolation is going to look like. When you walk in, there will be a welcome kit, which will have water and snacks. And again, all this information in there, resources, phone numbers to call to have on speed dial, 
a couple other masks and whatever fun things we can, what other fun things you, we can think of to put in there for when people are in isolation. Um, overview of life in the hotel. A lot of people, and know that we know that this is not ideal. We also know that a lot of people are going to be there to make this as, as the least impactful and miserable as possible being in isolation, um, because nobody wants to be in isolation if, as soon as they get to college. We completely understand that. I brought my son to school last year as a freshman, so I can only imagine what everyone's feeling, thinking that they might have this possibility going into college. So know that there's a lot of people wanting to make this as smooth and non-stressful as possible in a, in a very stressful environment. So we will have medical consultation and surveillance on a daily basis or every other day if the student's like, I'm fine, I don't need to be called every day, we'll respect that. Um, you will get meals um, from Bon Appetit through um, Emory Dining, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we'll give, make sure a lot of snacks are on hand. We'll fit your dietary your restrictions and preferences as much as we can. We will have obviously a lot of academic liaison support that will be inherited into the process. And we know again, emotional well-being is very important in the context of being isolated. Even though it's a very nice hotel, it's still isolating and not what you expected. So Office of Spiritual and Religious Life has put in in place an incredible chaplaincy model of support that students can get, take advantage of if that is something that they want to. Um, and a lot of volunteers to help with that. Also, there'll be virtual well being um, drop in for the counseling and psychological services, um, which is, we know, which is known as CAPS. If we use that acronym, it's called CAPS. Our residence life um, with leadership of Scott will be there to help with the transition, um, knowing that they're not coming right into the dorm. Get, getting that connection and making sure that transition back into the um, residence halls uh, is as smooth as possible. And there's unlimited cable and coffee makers. So to try to make it a little bit easier. So that's that's the overview of what life looks like in, in isolation. Um, we're building all this um, and it's gonna change and it's gonna improve and we'll understand what we need that we don't know yet because we all don't, the one thing that we're certain of is uncertainty and that we're gonna miss things and we're gonna correct them. Um, so I wanna just make sure that everyone has a, at least a picture of what it looks like going in, but knowing that it will change and improve over time. So I'm happy to take questions. So I saw one question in the chat about if you sign up for an appointment time for COVID testing and need to change it, look at your confirmation email and there should be a link in there where you can um, change the time. Um, so once you sign up, get that email and then go back to that email to change your time. And there was another question in the conference center hotel, there's not only cable and a coffee maker, but there is free Wi-Fi. So that's important. Which they are actually, actually actively boosting as we speak. Yeah, yes. and there were some questions about people who might be driving in or close to the Atlanta campus. So um, if their students do test positive, could they uh, forego the conference center and go home and then come back? Um, that might be good for a few people. So it looks like the answer is yes. Um, and then testing once they've finished their quarantine period or to come back and move into the residence. Absolutely. Okay. And we'll have them on our list of positive students. So we'll be following up with them. But it'll, it'll just look different. But we, you're, once you're here, you're our students. So, and Sharon and Betsy, will you again share the student health website and where all of these great FAQs will be posted for parents? Because I know there are a lot of great questions in the chat that I I know are have posted on our websites as well. So, the student our student health website is studenthealth.emory.edu, and there is several tiles for immunization insurance and the newest one is COVID-19 guide um, and we're rolling out we have the testing information and there's two testing blocks one is arrival testing and one is ongoing testing for people who become symptomatic or contacts over time so those are the two tiles that are live and active over the next couple of days all this information about isolation and quarantine will be live as well as our contact tracing um, FAQs and information will be live over the next couple of days as well. And Sharon, a question about being in the conference center hotel, will they have uh, 
daily maid service? Like, will they need to do their own laundry? Will they have towels replenished? What is the situation there? They will have, um, they'll be, they won't have daily turn down service, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think they can no, do that. Yeah. No mints on beds. Um, yeah. But there will be, um, they can bag up their laundry. So there will be laundry once or twice a week for clothing. And then if they want their sheets changed, they can put them in a bag and put them out their out outside their door. Same thing with trash. Right. So they could do yeah. that. Also. Just, just so they know that that's taken care of and they don't need to bring towels and things there. Good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I must say the hotel um, has been incredible. I mean, this is not what they signed up for either, <laughs> but they are in the service of making people happy. They're in the hospitality industry. So they are so happy and willing to make it as comfortable as possible. They're all parents and understand the situation and wanna just make it as, as easy and as comfortable for the students as possible. So. They're getting, they're getting a whole stock room ready for us to have incidentals, like if they run out of toothpaste and they need a new toothbrush and they have, they need deodorant or feminine products or whatever comes up, they will be stocked. I've given them a list of all the things that we, we wound up running, Betsy and I wound up gathering ourselves in spring when we had people in isolation and quarantine. So now we have a army of people to help. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, I think we're gonna move on now um, to show what's in that lovely welcome kit. And really for the majority of our students who will be moving in, um, we'll move on to that. So um, Betsy, I think you get one more hurrah of sharing what's in the welcome kit before we move on. Oh, I love that. So um, just the um, slide that you can see on your screen. So the cloth face mask, the wipes, there's the tool at the bottom. So that helps open um, doors, helps punch elevator buttons. The thermometer for us at Student Health is really important because that's, we want people to monitor their temperature twice a day. So that's really important. Um, lots of hand sanitizer wipes um, and the antimicrobial pen. So we're really excited to welcome you in this era of COVID to Emory. Can I speak to one really important question and it keeps popping up also is as far as the medical care, we have a team of um, providers right now. It's um, our APPs and our physicians to call the students who are positive and they call them daily. Again, sometimes students are like, you don't, I don't need to talk to you every day. Um, and because sometimes they get annoyed that we're hovering a little bit too much. Um, so we take that to heart, but you know, they get a call to make sure that the symptoms aren't changing, they're not worsening. We know with COVID, um, thing, people can start having symptoms later in the course, unlike flu, which is kind of hits you hard at the beginning. COVID is different. So we're, we, unfortunately, we've come accustomed to the pro what COVID looks like. And so we have the interventions and the medical surveillance to meet these needs. Um, so they will get a call. We do have, right now we have a COVID assessment um, clinic. It's over at our gym. We're actually moving that closer to our office next door. In fact, that's actually going live on Monday. We also actually the tents are up outside. We are having COVID testing areas um, to support if we need to over time. Those are going to be in our parking lot. So knowing that those medical options are all available. We have an assessment um, team on basically monitoring um, that inbox. If any student is sick um, or becomes sick over time, um, they have a contact that they know of, they go to our portal, they message the what's called the COVID assessment provider. Um, and then we call the student back, uh, do a whole assessment um, and then decide whether they need to come in and be seen because of their symptoms um, require that or they just need testing and supportive um, guidance, they get that too. Um, and then anyone who's symptomatic and, has a t uh, and or has a positive test gets that sort of medical surveillance which will over time grow um, to be a team for on campus and a team for off campus. Awesome. And sharing a couple of questions. Are the cloth mask washable that are in the kit? Yes. And I'm also very comfortable. Yes. Will students that are in the hotel together be able to interact with one another or they're isolated in their rooms, correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Great. 
And um, there are some questions too about the spring semester. I'll just say this before we move on. We have not made plans yet for the spring semester. So I know everybody's asking about all of that. And if you can't come to campus in the fall, what that looks like for spring. And we promise you will be the first ones to know once we have those um, decisions made. But at this time, focusing just on this fall move-in. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I think we can transition. We'll keep monitoring the chat and Sharon and Betsy can keep answering some questions for you as well. Um, but moving over to Rebecca Watson from our housing operations, who will tell us a little bit more about um, getting to campus. Thanks, Sherry. Um, so we've talked a lot about the test so far and what your process is going to look like when you um, arrive to campus so on your my housing page which is wh where you saw your housing assignment there will be a link um, there's a some text kind of a little bit further down from where your picture is um, and above your housing assignment it'll say welcome to campus please click here and it's a hyperlink to schedule your test um, and so that's going to take you directly to the testing sign up page. I know a lot of you have already done that. So kudos for those of you that have already signed up for the test. Um, the test, the, the site is going to ask you a series of questions to help guide, kind of guide you and funnel you through the different um, testing days and times and locations. So we've heard that there are some drive through sites and that there's also a walk up site. Um, one of the questions that it asks you pretty early on is how are you arriving to campus? So are you driving to campus um, in a, your personal vehicle or your family's personal vehicle? Um, you are planning on driving into the drive through location. If you check yes for that question, it's only going to show you test sites that can accommodate a drive through test. Um, it, the next uh, screen is a map of the Emory campus and it has the different um, test locations kind of highlighted there for you. And then it will ask you which one you want to choose. If you go on that previous slide uh, screen, if you say, say that you are um, arriving via airplane, you are taking Uber or a taxi or a ride share or um, public transportation to campus, you're considered a walk up. Um, there is no drive through facility for you um, or drive through capability for at uh, the walk-up location. Um, and so you would, you know, your Uber is gonna pull up to the curb, you would get out of the vehicle and you would walk into the testing facility um, that Betsy mentioned earlier. So it's really important that when you're filling that form out, um, that you answer, you know, depending on how you answer those, that question is gonna funnel you into kind of the next selection portion of things. Um, I know there were some questions a little earlier on here in the chat um, about folks that uh, may have signed up for the wrong one. You're welcome to go back in and change your time. So you just click that link again, you're gonna sign back in with your Emory login and password. Um, it'll display the selection that you've already made. So it will say, you know, our records show you've already signed up for this day, time, and location. Do you need to change it? You're gonna click yes, and you're gonna go through the process again. Um, it will erase the prior um, date, time, and location that you have already signed up for. Um, so if you need to make any changes, that's how you go ahead and do that. Um, there's also an email address in the confirmation email that you received. If there's any questions, feel free to email that email address. Um, and we will definitely work with you to schedule something or to assist you if you have any questions about that sign up process. And I think this next bit is Scott. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Rausch. I'm the uh, <laughs> Senior Director for Residence Life on the Atlanta campus. Um, have been at, at Emory for, um, for eight years. Uh, and we are um, super excited uh, to, to welcome all of you, families and students, um, to campus over the course of, of the move-in time. We've been working uh, very hard over the last couple of weeks and the summer uh, to make sure that we can do this move in safely and that we are going to provide as safe and as engaging a on campus opportunity um, as we can, um, knowing that it will be a little bit different, uh, but we're going to do our best 
um, to make sure that your students feel welcome, that your students feel engaged, um, but that most importantly, that your students are, are safe um, for us. And uh, so uh, what I'm gonna do over the course of the next couple of slides is kind of explain to you what the move-in process is, and then I'll, um, and then hopefully Rebecca uh, will come back uh, to help answer some of the questions because she's uh, much better at some of the housing-specific questions that some of you are asking around uh, furniture and different pieces uh, in the buildings. Um, most I do a lot of the people things. She does a lot of the stuff things, so she can help you with the stuff. Uh, but I'm going to work on the people. So um, in this slide, particularly what's important to know is that sort of the step one is arriving to your test site. And so it is really important for us in this process that, that, that the test site is where you go first. Um, you know, uh, we don't want to have to turn you back around from campus. We are, and I'll explain this in a minute, but ultimately we're going to be asking some screening questions before cars uh, are allowed to, to pull up to the residence halls. And so it is important that uh, that first step in your process be arrive at your test site so that you can get your positive test um, and do the things that you need to do during that process, which will then clear and open the gates for you to arrive onto campus. And so once you receive a negative result from your test, uh, you will proceed to campus. You'll be given a map, which will uh, both give you the GPS coordinates and um, some directions in terms of which hall you're gonna go to, uh, and then you will proceed uh, to that location. Some things that are important to note um, at the bottom of the slide is that you will be sent some uh, luggage demarcation uh, materials. Uh, it's important that that stuff be on your, your luggage by the time that you arrive so that you're not doing that in the car and it will slow kind of the process down uh, when you get um, to the sites. Um, and we wanna, I know, um, uh, Betsy and Sharon mentioned this, but it is important to pack lightly. It is really important um, in this time that we're not overwhelming the room spaces uh, with a lot, of, a lot of things, not bogging down your cars and or the buildings with a lot of stuff. Um, and so just thinking about what are, what are the things that you need to survive? Uh, and then, you know, thinking about what are the bare essentials in terms of those uh, extra things, uh, peripherals, as we like to say, uh, that you would bring with you. Um, and then the other thing that I will say, and I can't remember if we said this earlier, I was trying to listen for it. It is important that you pack just in case that you pack a bag that can help your students sort of navigate the 10 to 14 days they might be in isolation. Cause that'll be really helpful if they do get a positive test and the rare occasion that we do have a positive test if that student has that go bag, then we can separate the go bag with the student and the student can go check in with the go bag and then we can handle the transition of the things uh, to, to the residence hall. Um, and then lastly, uh, you can ship your items. Um, you can ship your items to campus. Uh, if those items arrive, I know we're, we're, we're pushing up against this deadline, but if the, uh, if the items do arrive by August 3rd, which is Monday, uh, our mail services folks will put those items in the room before you arrive. Um, if they arrive after the 3rd, there'll be a mail pickup, um, several mail pickup locations on campus where you can go and get your boxes and take them back with you uh, to your space. Um, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. I was in charge of that. So um, this won't look exactly the same for every residence hall, but the process will be similar. So there'll be, there'll be specific nuances um, in terms of where your car will go and how your car will be dealt with, um, whether or not you'll get in or out of your car, what the assistance will look like. Uh, but essentially it will all be sort of follow this framework, which is the cars will be screened. So there'll be an initial screen. So first of all, our, our volunteers and our students will be looking for, do you have a negative test result? That's their first thing. And then they will ask a series of questions um, to the helpers and the student just to make sure it's just a double check for us that everybody in that space is conscious of their health. I think one of the things that uh, Dr. Rabinovitz mentioned earlier, right, it's that this is not the time to tough through something, right? If you're feeling sick, my first thing, if you're feeling sick, you're not feeling good, don't come, just don't come. Uh, that's that's the first thing, we'll, we'll get you in another day, right? But don't come that day if you're not feeling well. Um, but these uh, screening questions are really just to make sure um, that you know that we care about your health and that you're also thinking about it, that you're processing through things that you might not think about um, in the normal process of, of a move-in or the normal process of your daily uh, sort of in experience through, um, through this process. Um, what we will do then, once the, the cars will be uh, parked, 
um, in a socially distant space. And then there will be sort of two options. There will be movers available. So folks that will be there that can unload your vehicle uh, into some carts and some dollies, and then they will take stuff directly to your room. Um, if that's uncomfortable for you, we will also provide, um, we will provide carts and dollies that are sanitized and safe for you to check out and to move yourself. It's really up to your comfort level. Um, we would love to move your stuff in. That's why our movers are there. Uh, but if that's something that just doesn't feel sit right with you, then we will have stuff that you can check out and do it yourself so that you are in control uh, of your things. We'll also be um, controlling entrances and exits to the building. Um, and so as you can see in the next sort of bullet point, uh, things that the student, once the students, the car is unloaded, um, the student will go in to get the uh, and that will be sometimes it's inside, sometimes it's outside, depending on the building. The student will go to the check-in station where they will receive um, their ID card, their key, and then they will get their guest helper lanyard, uh, which is something that they will then give to um, their, you know, the, the folks who are coming with them um, that can enter the building. I know there were some questions in chat, and I want to be pretty clear about why we're doing this. We really want one helper in the building at a time with students because we want to lower the density. We just don't want there to be a lot of students, even though some of the rooms might, you know, those of you who went to college before might consider these rooms palatial, um, they're still small enough where it's really hard to have people be, you know, in a distant space. That's why we're putting everybody in a single, right? So that you can have that six foot, that distant space uh, for yourself. And so if we're putting two, three, four people in that space at once, it sort of defeats the purpose of doing the, you know, the original de-densification. So we are going to say that, you know, please stick to whoever is wearing the lanyard. Now you can switch off that lanyard back and forth. If mom wants to go in and do a particular thing, that's great. Mom come back and give it to dad. If brother wants to go see the room, it's not about the, the number of helpers who maybe can access the space. It's how many helpers can access the space at one time. Um, and so that's kind of what, uh, the, um, the lanyard is for, and we will ask that if you are going into the space that you are, um, following all of our guidelines, right? That you are wearing a face covering, that you are staying six feet away, um, as humanly possible. I know that you just rode in a car for six to 10 hours with your child. So if you want to be on top of your kid, like that's going to be fine, but everybody else would probably like for you to stay six feet away from, um, and, you know, just try and make sure that you're washing your hands often, uh, if you're touching common services, if you're in common spaces, if you're using the restroom uh, in the building, just make sure that you're, again, staying six feet away, wearing that face covering, and making sure that you're washing your hands. Um, we will have a designated waiting area for, um, for the other helper folks. Um, there are going to be several tents set up on campus where uh, helpers can hang out for a bit, and, um, and there will be kind of boxed light snacks and water uh, there for folks in the space. There are going to be limited uh, dining options on campus. Um, there will be a coffee shop that will be open if you want to go and get a coffee and come back. Um, that's going to be a possibility, but it's going to be limited uh, to where you can do that. Um, the other things I think that I, I don't know if it's in the next slide, but I will say it twice if it is, is that once your car is unloaded, we will direct you to where you can park that vehicle. And then the other helper who parked the vehicle can return back to either the waiting area or if that's the person with the, the lanyard, they can they can go um, with their student into the, into the space. I think we can move on to the next one. Yeah, see he's right there. Uh, I was just, I was giving you a precursor to the next slide. Um, yeah, and so we want to make sure that, that folks, and then I'll, I'll try to answer some of the questions um, that folks asked earlier. Um, what I would say is, um, I'm, you know, pretty uniform answer. If a student tests positive um, at, um, at a drive up site, right, the, the key thing is there that that student has been in the car with you and your whoever's coming with you, right? And so ultimately, when we decontaminate, when we take the student over to the ECCH, uh, the Emory Conference Center Hotel, and we decontaminate their things, the things will go back to the room, but we probably won't have anybody else go up into that space because we don't know what your level is going to be at that point in time uh, since the student tested, tested negative. Now, what I will say is that, you know, if, if you, you know, if, if you want to, we could probably work out a way for you to come back when your student gets out of isolation to come back up into the space 
and and move in their building, um, you know, move their stuff and set the room up. That's probably not going to be uh, too hard of a thing to do. It's really just managing your schedule. But we will also have our staff here uh, to assist students to make sure that that reintroduction into the community is as easy and as welcoming um, as possible, knowing that it's going to be a difficult time for those students that test positive. And so we want to be really conscious of them, um, their, the, you know, their mental connection, their physical engagement to Emory. Uh, we're going to be very conscious of that as they transition from, from the hotel over to their residential facility. Um, and then, you know, we will, we will, I know there's a move in letter that's going to come out soon uh, from our housing operations folks, which will have some of these more granular details uh, in it um, and know that things are changing. And so we're trying to give, we, we, the reason why we haven't been communicating out to you every second of the day is because I don't want to communicate one thing out to you today and then have to change it tomorrow based on, on sort of what's happening. But we will continue to, to communicate with you as best we can around what things will look like, um, knowing that it's going to be, it's coming in a week. Uh, and we'll be ready for you uh, when you arrive. I think we can, oh, and oh, something I wanna address here. Yes, you can, uh, students, uh, parents and families and students can go off campus into Atlanta uh, to get other things that you might need that you may have forgotten or that you knew you were gonna come and get here. Um, you know, go to Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, those sort of things. We're sort of seeing the move-in period as kind of you know, that this from sort of when you arrive to kind of the end of that day is sort of your move-in period. So we'll keep the, pro the processes and procedures that you've seen in place for that day. And then once kind of the end of that day happens, then we're gonna kind of go into the next phase, which I will show you in a second. But ultimately, if you are trying to, to get things for your student, um, you know, that's possible. I say that with one caveat, and that is this whole thing is based upon trying to create um, not necessarily a bubble, but a contained community, right? And every time that we go into Atlanta or we go into the exterior community and come back, that's potential for us to kind of, you know, make it less safe, right? And so just, I, I would say, please go into the community and do the things you need to do, but limit those trips as, as much as you can um, so that we're not, we're, not, we're not creating a, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 trip kind of a thing, which then puts sort of you and other folks potentially at higher risk. I think we can move to the next slide. And I'm not really good at multitasking. So for uh, for Sherry and Bridget, if you are seeing questions in the chat, I'm not seeing them. <laughs> so um, okay, Scott, here's one for you. Uh, as I think I know this answer already, though the residence halls have been thoroughly cleaned, thoroughly cleaned, and they're cleaned right after people move out. Correct, Scott? So they've been cleaned and cleaned. Uh, they've been cleaned and will be cleaned during the day. So, you know, while, um, you know, we've been, they've been being cleaned and they'll be prepped uh, for, for the particular move in days, but they're also cleaned daily. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the common spaces, the bathroom spaces, um, the entryways, any places where there's common touch points, railings, elevators, all those sort of things. Um, A, there's signage there to sort of uh, make sure that you're following the social distance guidelines, but also our custodial staff, our building and residential services staff are going in and making sure these buildings are as clean and as safe as they can be. Right, The other, another question, Scott, is about food. Will, when does dining options start for the students? Dining options start the day that they move in. Okay, great. So I, think, I think they start with dinner on the 13th. I think that's-, mm -hmm. I think that's And there were some good questions too about food delivery and using things that we've all become used to with groceries or other food being delivered from on campus. Um, people who do not live in the residence halls, and you can confirm this, are not allowed in the residence halls. So while students are invited to order or bring food in onto campus, it won't, they won't be coming to their doors. Students will have to meet them outside. Yeah, and, and this gets, I mean, as you can read on the screen, this gets extreme, right? So after the move-in period happens, um, we're really only letting students who live in that building in that building, including you, parents. Uh, and so you can come back the next day and visit your student, but you have to do it in the exterior spaces. So under our tents or in our open spaces in the quads and on the fields, um, because we really are trying to limit the amount of people who are going in and out of this, the buildings to the residents who live there. And so if you're using DoorDash, or any or any of the the delivery pizza delivery systems or Publix or Kroger or any of the the, the groceries those would be delivered to the the space that's in front of the the exterior door and then a student will be expected to go out get those things and bring them back in we would not let a vendor 
uh, into the space um, to 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 del deliver food. We don't do that normally, just to be honest. Like we don't do that any other year. Um, but we're you know we're we're drawing a harder line if that's if that's possible uh, for for folks not to get into the buildings. Which then leads to I don't know if there was visitation questions uh, yet, but I'm gonna answer one in case they weren't. Uh, and so um, students within a building may visit other floors. So as students, once they're in the building, they can move freely uh, within the spaces. Um, we are recommending that when, they are, when they're in the common spaces that they are wearing a face covering, that they are observing the um, social distancing spaces and that they are, um, you know, they're washing their hands, their hands frequently, but they can move. So if you, if your student has a friend on the third floor and you live on the second floor, you can go up and visit that person. Uh, but they cannot visit people who do not live in other, they cannot visit another building. So they, they will not have access or should not be in another residence hall uh, to visit. If they want to visit someone, so, you know, using two building names, if someone lives in Raoul Hall and they want to visit someone who lives in Dobbs, there are plenty of open spaces between here and Dobbs that those students should be able to go and sit six feet apart and have a conversation. It shouldn't happen uh, in the buildings, though. Mm -hmm. And so, I, oh, I, go ahead, Sherry. I wanted to make sure that we get to the last slide and then maybe go back through because we are coming close to one o'clock um, and then we'll ask. Sure. Sure. Uh, so this is just again, again, you know, the move-in period we, we're thinking about is, is really that day. And once that day changes, um, you know, if you want to come back and visit your student, that is certainly allowed, but you wouldn't be able to do it in the building. You'd have to do it in exterior space. And then I think the next one is on the next slide, if we want to go to it, is on programming. Um, we are going to try uh, as hard as we can um, to, to create an environment that students feel connected to, um, that students want to be in, and that really show off what it's like to be an Emory student. And so we are going to try really hard to um, connect students to each other. Um, that's through virtual hall meetings or small in-person um, socially distanced uh, events that, that will happen uh, in the buildings. Um, we will also uh, try to honor as many traditions. I know for some of you, you've been hearing about things like Songfest since your student accepted to come to Emory. Songfest will happen. It's not going to look like it has looked in previous years, but it will happen. And so we are, we are trying really, really hard to create spaces where the traditions are respected and, and kept and that students feel connected, not just sitting at their desk for eight hours a day um, and looking at a Zoom screen, but have spaces where they can talk to other students, can interact with our staff um, and make sure that they, uh, they feel connected to the campus. And actually that brings up a really great point. I've seen some of these questions in the chat too about can students move around campus and even get off campus, what are shuttles like? Um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about our social compact and you know, students will be able to leave campus and come back into their residence halls, but why it's so important that they're really thinking about this. You know, we are trusting your students to really step up and, and act like adults and good citizens, not only for our campus of the world, to wear their face coverings, to wash their hands on and off campus, um, to monitor their symptoms if that's happening, to let us know. And, you know, it does look differently than other years where we would say, please go to Atlanta. We're not going to restrict that. But I think those are important things to think about and have conversations with your students about now. Yeah, and we'll do that. And we'll, we'll start to do that with the, with the floor meetings specifically. We'll talk about what it means uh, to, to live in the environment of the Amory Community Compact, what it means to be a good floor mate, to be a good hall mate. Um, as it relates to safety and security and, and your social responsibility as a student and ours as staff members um, to create a community that's as safe as, it, as, as possible. Um, and that means wearing masks. That means being conscious that it's not just about you, right? That we are one sort of cog in the larger wheel of everybody that's going to be on campus. And we need to be thinking about that with our actions. And so, if, you know, as we're traveling off campus, um, as we're interacting with folks on campus, we need to have those values in our head so that we're not putting ourselves at risk and then consequently putting a bunch of other folks at risk because we come back um, onto campus. And I know folks have been reading the news around large gatherings and fraternity parties and things that have happened on schools uh, across the country. And you know, what I want is that for our students to understand that, that that's just not something that we're gonna tolerate. 
right? It's not something that we're going to do here. We are going to follow the rules. We are going to be respectful and we are going to try and follow the community compact so that we can all be safe at the end of the day, because ultimately you're trusting us with your most prized possession that is your child. And, uh, and we want to make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to not um, to gain that trust and to keep it. The other part we want to mention is Scott has a really talented staff. Their jobs have been student development. Their jobs are about working with young people. So we want to know what your students think are fun ideas because coming up with it ourselves is one thing, but what did they think would be fun ideas? And I think we'll be surprised at how creative they can get together. Um, and Scott, would you mention a little bit about the Proctor setup that we'll have to, to try to you know, ensure that people are following the policy in the spirit of the policy? Yeah, so we have, so um, the our student staff, our resident advisors and our sophomore advisors will sort of be folks that will be around in the buildings to make sure that folks are remembering what the processes are and that the, the things that they need to be uh, upholding as it relates to the social, the, uh, the Emory Community Compact. And so we, but we will have a group of, of proctors who are a group of students, upper class students, who will also be kind of wandering around the campus um, each night, uh, seven days a week, um, just making sure that students are remembering. It's really not about enforcement as much as it's about education. It's about students saying, hey, I see 10 people together here. Like, let's have a conversation about how far apart you are or what you need to be doing. You know, hey, you're not wearing your mask right now. What can we do to make sure that you're doing that? And, and so those folks will be around um, and they'll be talking to folks, engaging with folks. Uh, and their, their goal really is just to make sure that everybody remembers why we're here uh, and that everybody remembers what we all agreed uh, to do when we agreed to come back. And I know we've really focused so much about um, coming to campus and being on campus, but we realize we won't have our entire first year class with us. I think we have probably about um, almost a thousand first year students who are coming back, but that means we have several hundred who will be joining us from around the world. Um, and you are all just as much of a part of this community in the class of 2024 and our new transfer students um, as people living on. I know that we will extend those opportunities to connect with students both um, in classes, um, things like our PACE and our health classes that all first year students take are all online and will be in small enough formats where people can get to know other students. So many of our student organizations and groups will be having virtual programs and other ways to connect. So. While it will look differently, um, we really do want to make sure that everybody feels like they have their place in this community as well. Yeah, and I, I, just to speak to that, we are, I know there's a question in the chat and Sherry spoke to it. We are trying very, very hard for, from a programmatic standpoint to think about how we connect to the students who aren't here and connect your students to those students. Um, and so one of the things that we talked, we talked with a bunch of student leaders yesterday and we're going to assign RAs to all of the students who won't be living on campus. Um, and so they will have virtual RAs who will check in with them um, occasionally. Um, and so that's a thing that will happen and we'll try to connect folks. But we, we are going to try, especially when we do virtual programming, to sort of simulcast that to our folks on campus and our folks off campus so that they can feel connected. And I think that's it. I'm done. We're just at <laughs> one o'clock now. Um, and Bridget and I would just like to thank our panelists so much. Maybe we'll go down the line, um, starting with Dr. R. Any parting, parting points, any other things that you've seen on the chat that you want to share? Um, I guess a couple things. Student health is all, is, we're all focused on COVID, but student health is available for non-COVID care and support, um, as is counseling and psychological services and psychiatry. A lot of it will be telehealth um, provided, but um, I, I want to make sure the fact that there are other problems that occur and concerns that parents have, so that will be available. Um, and again, to reiterate to the students that um, there's a lot of things we don't have control over, but keeping us here through behaviors is a really strong, important message that we are sharing with our community. Um, I'm trying to think if there was any other things that I wrote down. Um, Blaze, can you put in the um, COVID testing um, email in the chat, please? So if you have any questions for about the testing process specifically, it's rtc student covid testing at emory.edu. And one thing I thought of, I think we used the medical word. Um, if your 
son or daughter is in isolation, we will have medical surveillance. So what that means from a student health perspective is um, one of the providers like me would be calling um, the student every day doing a virtual assessment. So it's a really thorough medical assessment. If there are any issues or any concerns medically, we bring them into the clinic. We have a COVID assessment clinic um, and we do an exam there. We have great Emory um, support with our infectious disease department. Um, so we have some really incredible resources right here on our campus. About five blocks from the Emory Conference Center Hotel is the Emory Hospital Emergency Room. So for anything severe, um, that's we have some incredible resources on campus. So when we talk about medical surveillance, it's really, we, we are keeping on top of people who are identified as having COVID. So just wanted to make that clear. Awesome. Rebecca Scott, I'll start with Rebecca. Anything else about move-in or times or housing assignments? Just that we are so excited to welcome you guys to campus in a couple of weeks. Um, for those of you that are recent deposits and recent admits, um, you've been doing a great job filling out the application and we're getting you assigned as quickly as we can. So just keep um, checking out your My Housing page if there's any outstanding um, forms that you need to fill out. Uh, housing related forms, you'll see a message on your screen regarding that. And then you'll also see your assignment there. And once your assignment posts, then you'll get the link to go sign up for a testing time. Fantastic. Scott? I, I would just say, I know that this is um, nerve wracking uh, for you. And I, I know that it's, um, you're putting a lot of trust in us, but I would ask just if you have questions, ask us, don't hesitate to ask them. No question is too big or too small or wrong or right. You know, um, we want to answer the questions as best we can. So please reach out to us, communicate what you're feeling so that we can answer your questions. Just know a lot of times this is, this is a real life thing that we're all changing in the moment. And so we might, my, my answer to you or our answers to you might be like, I don't know, give us a minute. Uh, but, and we'll figure it out, but I think we do want to hear from you. So please, please, please reach out to us if you have questions, uh, and let us know, um, what's on your minds. And, um, Bridget and I will be hosting our final Friday family webinar next Friday on the 7th, uh, where we're going to be talking about, um, supporting your students in an online learning environment. We have our experts who have helped train our Emory faculty on how to be amazing online um, deliverers of content, and we'll be talking a lot about academic support. Um, as a reminder, too, your students will be registering August 10th and 11th, and so they've had all, they've been doing such a great job in their registration webinars um, and, and meetings. It's been a joy to speak with them and, and get excited with them about the classes they're going to take. Um, as a reminder, the orientation schedule will be posted next week. Um, you can always visit our orientation website, which is posted right now on this webinar. Um, this webinar, along with the rest of our series from the summer, will all be posted on our websites too. So please feel free um, to go back and rewatch. You'll see lots of friendly faces um, who you've met earlier in the summer as well. Bridget, is there anything else you want to share before we close out for today? Yep, yeah, just that we appreciate all that you're doing as families. We know this has been just an incredible uh, amount of courage that we've had to put into all of this. We want you to know at Emory, we are problem solvers. That's what we do. That's what our challenge has been. And so we've had our biggest challenge yet with this pandemic, but we're hoping with collaboration with you and bringing your students to campus, we'll get them here. We'll be able to educate them and you'll see that they'll have a very meaningful experience. So we're looking forward to working with them and with you, but thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. We hope you have a healthy, safe weekend and look mm -hmm. forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Mm -hmm.